Um, good evening. You're very welcome to this latest uh, Young Professional Network event, uh, focusing on Ireland's recent presidency of the UNSC and the much wider uh, UN Security Council agenda. Um, my name is Dara Moriarty. I work in research and communications here at the Institute and I chair our YPN. I'm um, absolutely delighted this evening to be joined by Richard Gowan, who I'm going to formally introduce in a moment. Um, he's right in the middle of the action in New York um, around the UN scene, um, and he'll be discussing um, a couple of different things to us this evening. Um, he'll give initial remarks, and then we'll pick up with some, some Q&A, and then we're really keen to hear from the audience as well with your questions. Um, firstly, he's going to offer us a, a bit of sort of initial reflection and insight just on the very recent um, Ireland presidency of the UN Security Council, which just concluded in September. September. Um, secondly, then he'll sort of widen the scope a little bit further and look at the 2021-2022 UN Security Council agenda. And then lastly, I suppose he's going to sort of zoom out even further than that and look at the actual focus and function of the UNSC in the global multilateral order. So a lot on our plate this evening. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into that um, with, with Richard. And um, before I begin and introduce Richard, just let me formally mention some of the, the, the housekeeping issues that we have, which I'm sure you're all very accustomed to at this point around Zoom. Uh, you can get involved, as I mentioned, by submitting your questions through our Q&A function. I'll be keeping an eye on them and post them to Richard directly. Um, and then also you can obviously join the discussion on social media. You can get involved on Twitter. Uh, using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag YPN. And then finally, we will be uploading this, this full discussion to our YouTube channel and to our podcast platforms as well, so you can listen back if you missed anything or want to take some notes. Um, let me just now formally introduce Richard. Um, Richard oversees the, the UN uh, work for the International Crisis Group, um, liaising with diplomats and UN officials in New York. He was previously a consulting analyst with ICG in 2016 and 2017. <laughs> um, he's worked at the European Council on Foreign Relations, New York University Center for International Cooperation and Foreign Policy, and he's taught at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University and Stanford in New York. So a very distinguished speaker to address us um, this evening. Um, Richard, thanks very much for taking the time out of your agenda. Uh, you're very, very welcome. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dareth, and thank you very much to everyone for uh, joining the call. Um, and it's nice to see uh, some friends' names uh, amongst the participants as well uh, today. Yeah, I, what I'm going to do is set the scene with a few words about the state of the Security Council in general. Um, and then dive down into uh, you know, a very brief and very preliminary assessment of Ireland's performers, performance in the council in its first nine months um, on the job. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I think you'll find that it's a, a very positive assessment too. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how Irish diplomats are seen in New York, um, you know, how the mission is working at a technical level dealing with day-to-day -day diplomatic challenges. And then I'll talk about a few of the themes, uh, such as the conflict in Ethiopia and um, bigger questions like climate security, which Ireland has to some extent made its own um, in council debates since January of this year. But just to set the stage, a few comments on the bigger picture. Uh, this has been, I think, both a year of hope, uh, but also a year of shocks in the Security Council. Uh, the reason that it's been a year of hope is fairly obvious, and that is that the Trump administration, which was instinctively very negative and very disruptive towards the UN, left office in January and was replaced by a Biden administration that overall has been uh, far more friendly towards the institution and far more willing to look for ways to work through the Security Council. I don't think we can underestimate how much damage Trump had actually done to the US presence at the UN, um, especially in his last couple of years in office. And with the US refusing to engage in many debates in the Security Council, uh, the, the Council as a whole had lost a lot of energy. And uh, I think Ireland was fortunate to be joining the Council at a pivotal moment where the US wanted to re-engage and wanted to show that it takes the institution and takes international cooperation much more seriously. And we'll come on to some of the areas like the conflict in Ethiopia, where Ireland has actually been able to work, I think, uh, 
uh, very effectively um, with the Americans. But it has also been a year of shocks. It has been a year where a series of crises um, have challenged the Security Council, some of them almost entirely unpredictable, um, some of them, you know, in, in some ways predictable, but still uh, very, very hard for the diplomats to handle. Those crises have included uh, the coup in Myanmar um, on the 1st of February, uh, which pretty much coincided with Biden's people um, coming to the UN for the first time. Uh, it included the May conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, which caused a major rift inside the Security Council about how to react. And then perhaps above all, it's included the, the Afghan crisis in August, uh, which uh, you know, has hit uh, diplomats in New York as hard as it's hit, hit everyone, you know, shaking up a lot of our assumptions about um, you know, how the US can deal with uh, you know, deal with conflicts worldwide and, you know, what we're trying to achieve through peacemaking and, and peace building in places like Afghanistan. So it's been a year of unpleasant surprises. I, I would say that prior to the high level General Assembly session um, in September, there was a, a lot of talk around the UN about, you know, whether the US was losing its way, whether the US could remain a credible leader after Afghanistan. I think that Joe Biden actually did a good job in his speech um, to the General Assembly uh, in late September in sort of stopping that sort of chatter. He was honest about what had gone wrong in Afghanistan, but he also, uh, I think, made some fairly powerful interventions about the challenge of climate change and the challenge of COVID that uh, won over a lot of his audience. Um, so I think it's still fair to say that um, you know, the Biden administration uh, carries a lot of weight in New York. Diplomats find it much, much easier to work with the American team now than they did prior to January. Um, but nonetheless, there, you know, there have been a lot of shocks to the system. And uh, the Irish, along with the Norwegians, Mexicans and other uh, elected members of the council have had to try and find ways to navigate those shocks. So what's the, what's the take on how Ireland has performed? Um, I think that the overall view of the Irish team in New York is very positive. And there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, firstly, the most important thing uh, in any diplomatic mission is the personnel and the personnel are good. Um, Ambassador Geraldine Byrne-Nason is uh, very well respected amongst her colleagues, but all the way down the system, uh, you have a, a team of officials who uh, know their files, um, who did a lot of hard work in terms of preparation and learning the files before January, and who are generally seen to be activist. Um, the, you know, in, in any debate, uh, you know, Irish diplomats sort of have positions, have priorities, um, that they're, they're fully engaged. And, and that has been noted and that has been respected. I think it's also worth saying that um, uh, Ireland has got some of the details of being in the council right. Uh, communications is an obvious one. Uh, it's actually very important in this day and age for Security Council missions to have a strong presence on Twitter, to be getting out their political positions in the public domain. And I think if, if any of you follow uh, Irish Mission UN on Twitter, you will sort of know that they uh, have done a very good job of, of communicating to the outside world, um, including during the presidency uh, in September. So overall, um, I think the Irish are getting, are getting very good reviews from their, their counterparts. I mean, there are naturally some, some criticisms. Um, interestingly, the, the one criticism I hear quite a lot uh, comes from Ireland's EU partners. And that criticism is that um, actually Ireland is not really being a very good EU member in the Security Council. And by that, they mean that Dublin isn't really looking to Brussels for leads on how to deal with many of the situations on the council agenda. Um, uh, the Irish are not really looking to other EU missions in, uh, in New York for leads on how to deal with uh, the crises that uh, you're facing, uh, 
instead there's a sense that um, Ireland very much wants to have its own national policy and to carve out its own course on a lot of the crises that it's looking at. And um, part of that is also that um, Ireland has sort of invested a lot, for example, in building close relations with the African members of the council. And so I think that, um, you know, I think that actually tactically it's important for Ireland to reach out beyond the EU group to be listening to the full range of council members. But it is, it is worth saying that this is the one criticism that I, that I often hear, uh, that some other EU members feel that in contrast to, for example, maybe Belgium or Germany last year, uh, the Irish are, are a bit less bound by the EU um, than, than others might like. But anyway, what has is, what is all this delivered? Um, because, you know, I was talking to a member of the Irish mission the other day and, uh, you know, he said what, what every uh, elected member of the council always says, which is that you can do all the training that you like, you can have all the plans, you can have all the mechanisms for getting instructions from capital. But the reality is when you enter the council, you're hit by a flood of crises. And the day-to-day -day work of the council is overwhelming. The number of issues that are on the council's agenda um, is, is enormous. And uh, you know, even for a, a relatively well-informed foreign um, ministry such as Ireland's, uh, you know, you're having to deal with questions about what to do in, for example, the Central African Republic that do not come naturally. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the preparation is important, but the reality is always a bit of a shock. And in a year of major crises, the level of shock has been high. Well, I think that overall, um, Ireland has done. A, a good job respond, responding to some of the main crises that has um, that have hit it, while also staying true to some of the the big themes that Dublin promised that it would pursue uh, while in the council. Um, I think the crisis where Ireland really made a mark early on and actually impressed the incoming American team uh, was Ethiopia, and at the start of the year. No one was really sure what was happening with the conflict in Ethiopia, uh, which kicked off, I think, in November uh, 2020. Um, there were some in the Security Council, such as the Russians, who were arguing that really the UN didn't need to bother with what was going on in Ethiopia, that it was an internal political issue that outside pa powers shouldn't interfere in. But the Irish, from a very early stage, identified a major humanitarian crisis brewing in Ethiopia and quietly, gradually got together with the African members of the council, um, that's Kenya, Niger, and Tunisia, um, to start saying, look, the council needs to debate this. The council needs to put out some statements about the importance of um, at least getting humanitarian assistance into the Tigray region of, of Ethiopia. The African group was initially skeptical. Um, quite naturally, they didn't want to offend Addis Ababa. Um, but as time went by, uh, the African positions have converged uh, with those of the Irish, and um, Ireland has been a sort of a leading voice in the council for keeping a light on what's going on uh, in Ethiopia as the Tigray conflict intensifies and spreads. And this is something which um, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the US ambassador uh, to the UN, uh, who arrived in late February, um, has given uh, Geraldine and her team a lot of credit for. Um, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who is an old Africa hand in the State Department, um, is personally very concerned about the situation in Tigray. She said from the beginning it would be one of her priorities, but she's also recognized that actually it's been very useful to have Ireland you know, leading a lot of these discussions about what to do in Ethiopia, because if it was just the US, that would actually create more political blowback. Now, sadly, Ireland's efforts have not succeeded in ending the crisis in Ethiopia. It's actually getting worse. Um, there's a lot of tension with China and Russia still over what to do about this crisis. But the council is now seized of Ethiopia. And I think Ireland is recognized as one of the de facto leaders in, in discussing that, that situation, which we would not have predicted back in January, and which was by no means guaranteed back in January. January. And it was the fact that um, your team in New York were willing to run with this, backed up strongly by Dublin, um, that allowed them to sort of get a toehold, get a foothold in an important diplomatic debate. 
Other areas where Ireland has sort of performed notably um, include working closely with Norway uh, to guide the renewal of uh, the UN's mandate for cross-border aid to Syria in June or July. Uh, we can go into this in more detail in the Q&A, but um, back in 2014, I think, uh, the Security Council authorized the UN to get aid into Syria without government permission. Um, Russia has increasingly tried to um, undermine that mandate in recent years. Uh, Norway and Ireland were charged with guiding a resolution through continuing the cross-border aid this summer. And again, I think they, they worked very closely um, with the Biden administration, which was very concerned to keep this mandate alive to ensure that there was a successful outcome to that process. Now that cooperation with the US was not easy. I think the US was um, doing a lot of back-channel diplomacy in Geneva, a lot of back-channel diplomacy in other capitals, working with the Turks, um, trying to get a deal with the Russians. I'm not sure the Irish and Norwegians always felt that the US was um, uh, as open with them as it could be about its diplomatic intentions. But at the end of the day, um, the push worked and um, Norway, Ireland and the US were able to keep this mandate alive and the resolution for cross-border aid was extended by another year in early July. And this was um, again a win that Thomas Greenfield, but also I think senior figures in, in Washington uh, very much appreciated. Uh, two other more thematic areas um, where Ireland um, has made its mark. Uh, that I would highlight are around the women, peace and security agenda, and then around the climate security agenda. And I'll just touch on these and then I'll, um, you know, I'll wrap up my initial remarks. Uh, the Irish mission here is seen as uh, very much a, a leader and very much an activist on um, questions of women, peace and security. Uh, there is an informal working group on, on WPS, as UN nerds know it, here in New York, Ireland is co-chairing that with, with Mexico. And um, uh, Ireland has used that pulpit uh, very effectively um, to put out a series of quite strong statements on, for example, um, the need to include women in the peace process in Yemen. But Ireland's work on women, peace and security really came into focus in August with the collapse in Afghanistan. When the Security Council um, uh, negotiated a resolution basically calling on the Taliban to behave responsibly after the fall of Kabul. And I think one big question about that resolution was whether it would refer to the position of women in, Af in Afghanistan. Now, all the Western Council members were agreed that the resolution should at least reference women's rights, but Ireland and Mexico pushed um, hard for it to include some language about women's participation in post-war politics in, in Afghanistan. And I think there's a feeling that um, Ireland and Mexico succeeded in getting that language into the resolution about women's participation in politics over the objections of, of China and Russia. And so it's just a few words and we don't know if the Taliban have, have read those words, but at least it was an important symbolic gesture during a very, very difficult moment in the council's history. Finally, <coughs> sorry, finally, um, there is climate security. And from the beginning of the year, Ireland had been emphasizing that it would like to see the Security Council pass a resolution, um, its first resolution on um, uh, the security implications of climate change. And um, the Irish have been working closely with the African members of the council, particularly Niger, uh, to achieve this resolution. Uh, there had been some hope that it might be possible to pass a resolution on climate security in September during the Irish presidency. But China and Russia and also India are all quite skeptical of this proposal. So it was concluded that September was too early. Nonetheless, the Taoiseach led, I think, a, a well-received debate on climate security um, during the high level week of the General Assembly in the Security Council. And on the 30th of September, I think I'm right in saying, maybe a few days beforehand, um, Ireland and Niger tabled a draft resolution um, calling for the UN to take uh, climate security more seriously. Now that resolution is still under negotiation. Um, there was 
a detailed read through of the text on Monday involving all council members. We think that the, the negotiations will go on at least into December um, when Niger holds the presidency of the Security Council. Uh, India, China and Russia remain highly skeptical and it's not clear that they can be persuaded to back this and obviously China and Russia could veto um, the text. But I think there is still also a chance that they will agree to this resolution. And so by the end of this year, Ireland will be able to claim, we hope, that it has been one of the co-parents of uh, a very significant, I think, council product on, on climate change. We still have to see if that's the case. And you know, clearly we're still only in the first year and I suspect there are many more shocks to come uh, for Ireland and everyone else in the Security Council. But so far I would say that the Irish team in New York has navigated a, a difficult year um, creatively. It's got points on the board, uh, as um, uh, basketball players like to say over here. And um, I think it's getting a lot of respect uh, around the UN system for that. Um, brilliant, Richard. Look, thanks very much for that very rich and, and deep analysis of, of, first of all, sort of the year it's been. Um, with, with, with the Biden administration taking up and sort of the, the gear change that represents from Trump. Uh, we might touch on that a little bit more in the Q&A, but then I just think on Ireland in particular, um, you know, you covered uh, so much in detail there. Um, you know, I think the general population in Ireland are obviously a lot more aware of Ireland's presence on the UN Security Council and the UN agenda in general, but maybe they don't have the same uh, level of, of, of knowledge of all the intricacies and I think for you to be able to sort of outline them all there and some of the key the key issues where they've made headway I think is really useful for um, for the attendees this evening and obviously then for the people who will also watch and listen back to this this discussion so thanks very much for that um, if I may I'll kick off with my own couple of questions um, and, and those watching in please feel free to, to get stuck in as well and drop your questions in um, to to Richard, um, you've heard there that the breadth of his knowledge on, on all the different issues, so he's, he's well versed to sort of talk on, on a number of different areas. Um, I might start to just pick you up on the beginning of your presentation, then we'll get to Ireland, just around that dynamic of the Biden administration coming in. Um, you know, I saw you writing a piece about his, his big speech at the General Assembly. Um, how, how do you feel that went and how do you feel sort of the UN system has responded to America being back, for want of a better term? How, how has that gone down? Well, firstly, I mean, you know, more generally, it's been very easy for US officials to say America is back. But, um, you know, the US system does not turn you know, on a dime uh, when administrations change. And even though the Biden team were very keen to demonstrate their commitment to multilateralism early on, uh, for example, by rejoining the Paris climate deal, uh, you know, it, it has taken time for the US system to start re-engaging constructively um, with parts of the UN that, uh, uh, that the, the Trump administration had boycotted. And you know, it's worth saying that there are still a lot of um, Trump decisions that are resonating in the UN that Biden hasn't resolved. Uh, you know, to take quite a minor one that uh, has been in discussion in New York this week, uh, Trump recognized Morocco's sovereignty of the Western Sahara. Now this makes um, UN efforts to find a political solution to the Western Sahara conflict very, very difficult. Um, the Biden team have not explicitly walked back from Trump's position on Morocco sovereignty. Um, so, you know, turning the ship takes takes time. Uh, again, you know, another early statement from Washington was that the US would rejoin the Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, which Trump had pulled out of. The Human Rights Council election is today. I haven't seen the results, but I mean, the US will have got its seat because uh, it was a clean slate. But it will it will be some time before the U.S. is sort of you know really fully re-engaged in uh, in Geneva, and I think there have also been a couple of incidents, um, such as the the May Israeli Palestinian violence, uh, which have somewhat compromised the claim that America is back. The U.S. in May uh, blocked any sort of Security Council statement on the violence in the Middle East because it claimed that it would alienate the Israelis. And the fact that the Biden administration took that position 
I think really irritated a lot of um, other members of the council, I, I think, in, including Ireland. So the US return has by no means been smooth. Nonetheless, I, I would say that um, Biden did a good job in his General Assembly speech, um, uh, really by trying to focus attention away from some of these specific crises, you know, like the Israeli-Palestinian situation or you know, like Afghanistan. But instead, he tried to focus on global issues like COVID-19 and, and climate change. And I think he made quite a strong case in that speech that um, the US uh, can continue to lead on issues like, uh, issues like climate. Now, of course, in, in making that case, he was sending another message, which was that um, the US is better qualified to lead than China is. And you know, Chinese-US relations remain tense at the UN. But overall, I think that you know Biden did remind uh, other presidents and prime ministers in New York that you know U.S. leadership is is still pretty essential in a lot of multilateral processes, and we shouldn't always obsess about the bumps in the road of America re-engaging, um, but instead see the overall direction of travel. Brilliant. Uh, Richard, thanks very much for that. A couple of questions coming in there now. Uh, please keep them coming in and we'll, we'll, we'll get on to them and post them to Richard. Um, just another question I'd like to put to you as well. You know, you sort of mentioned the, the array of areas where Ireland is really doing well and it's, it's well regarded um, among, among its colleagues and, you know, not for a second wanting to, to gloss over them. Um, because I think, I think, you know, we are following them and I think the issues around Ethiopia that you mentioned is sort of the the, the, the credit that Ireland has in the bank for its sort of commitment to handling and trying to find some sort of resolution to those issues um, is obviously very, very welcome. And we're, you know, we're delighted to hear that as, a, as an international first think tank to hear the regard that Ireland has held in in that respect. But you did also mention the sort of the, the sort of unilateral approach maybe that Ireland takes from its own foreign policy standpoint, um, maybe not, not, not. Uh, coordinating as well with, with its European colleagues. Um, I suppose looking at Ireland's actual campaign, you know, they really did set themselves up as this broker, this honest broker that, you know, wouldn't be taken in by, by sort of maybe dogmatic positions within Europe, but they, they could reach out to African nations, small island nations, um, et cetera. So, I mean, how, how do you see that dynamic actually playing out? And is that just Ireland being true to the campaign it ran? I mean, I think that's completely right. I think that, um, you know, Ireland had uh, made it clear that in this, you know, in the council, as in many other UN processes, it would um, sort of give a hearing to views from non-Western countries, you know, with a degree of sympathy that perhaps not all EU members always do. And so um, uh, in that sense, the way that Ireland engaged early with, uh, the African members of the council on, on Tigray, uh, as I described, was entirely in keeping with um, Ireland's campaign pledges. Uh, I mean, I think one of the reasons this EU question does come up a lot is that obviously there's been a bit of a shift in the EU's profile um, in, the, uh, in the Security Council over the last couple of years. Uh, two years ago, um, five of the 15 council members were, were EU states, um, uh, including at that time, the UK. Um, and in that period, when countries like Sweden and the Netherlands uh, were on the council, or more recently, Germany, um, there was quite a strong sense of, you know, the EU being a force um, in Security Council affairs. Uh, now, sadly, um, and I won't say any more on that, we have had Brexit, um, but also Norway is holding one of the, uh, the Western European seats, um, you know, sitting outside the EU. And so the, you only have three EU countries in, in the council, France, which obviously has its own very clear national positions on UN affairs, Estonia, which um, is, uh, has been a good member of the EU team, but in some ways is, is closer to the Americans than maybe the, the EU norm. And then Ireland, which is carving out its own its own national sort of uh, approach to a lot of the crises on the agenda, and so you know instead of there being a sense of a strong EU sort of 
block in the council as there was in maybe 2017, 2018, you have more of a sense of a sort of a disparate group of um, uh, European countries following their own national interests and their own sort of particular approaches to, uh, to diplomacy. Um, and next year, uh, you know, we'll actually be down to an EU two because Estonia will leave um, and Albania will take its place as the one Eastern European country on, on the council. Now, Albania is actually um, uh, very closely aligned with the EU on most issues. So it, it, you know, it will be a sort of a fairly loyal follower. But I, I mean, I think what we're coming down to here is, you know, the classic problem of EU diplomacy at the UN, which is uh, to be effective, European countries have to talk to non-European countries. Um, you have to sort of secure their votes, you have to secure their support, secure their sympathy. But when you have different European countries, you know, using different tactics to, to win over the Africans or whatever, the sense of an EU foreign policy identity in New York does, um, uh, does dissipate a bit. And I think that's what, what, we've, what we've seen over the last, um, uh, the last year. <coughs> right. Um, thanks very much, Richard, for that. Um, I'll jump into some questions. Um, colleague of mine, Ross Fitzpatrick. Um, Ross is uh, the IH research from the Global Europe team, just for, for listeners in, and he's been he's been writing extensively on sort of Ireland's Ireland's position within the UN and all the different issues that are that are ongoing. Um, and he has a question for Richard. He says that he thanks you for your presentation, he comments on your excellent insights, and he just he, he I'll read out his question exactly. Um, due to the crises in Afghanistan, Syria, Haiti, Ethiopia and elsewhere, the dire political humanitarian human rights situation in Myanmar is one which is falling off the Council's agenda in recent months, he says. Um, does Richard have any hope for the upcoming ASEAN summit to achieve any political progress? And is there a case to be made for shifting responsibility away from the Council where regional organisations like ASEAN may be better placed to deal with complex regional issues? And I should just say on that particular note, uh, tomorrow at the Institute, tomorrow lunchtime, actually, we have the UN Special Envoy for Myanmar speaking to us. Um, so we should hopefully put his question to her as well and see what she thinks. Uh, but Richard, what, what, what would your view be on, on Ross's question there? I mean, yeah, the, the Myanmar story um, uh, in the council, it's almost been the reverse of the Ethiopia story. Um, you know, Ethiopia at the start of the year no one seemed to be paying any attention to it until Ireland started to stir up interest and then you know, the US uh, joined the Irish. And now the council is really seized of what's happening in Ethiopia. By contrast, after the, the 1 February coup um, in Myanmar, uh, for a month the council was, it was you know, incredibly focused um, on what was happening uh, there. And, um, everyone was taken off balance even the chinese it seems were quite badly taken off balance by this coup and that the chinese frankly did not want the coup to happen and so you had this brief period where it was possible for the uk uh you know leading the talks um with the chinese to persuade um to persuade yeah even china and russia to back a, se a series of statements condemning the coup and calling for a, re a return to normal politics uh, you know, then tragically, uh, the coup, despite a lot of resistance and violence, held. And you know, the the junta remains in power. And certainly, my my colleagues at Crisis Group, who are covering the situation on the ground, say that although there is serious resistance to the junta, it's unlikely that you're going to see it collapse anytime soon. And so, you know, in, and in the same period, the Chinese have grown less less willing to uh, to cooperate with the West on this issue. And in the council, um, you know, attention has fallen away from, from Myanmar, um, you know, while, you know, uh, you know, Afghanistan and other shocks have um, come up the agenda. Uh, the way that the council sort of dealt with this issue was essentially to turn to ASEAN as an alibi. Now, the one thing that everyone could agree on uh, in, in New York was that uh, ASEAN should be allowed to try and find a political solution um, to this crisis. But I would say that, you know, in honesty, a lot of UN diplomats, uh, you know, 
felt they, they, they would turn to ASEAN because they had no other options, but they didn't really believe that um, it was going to make a, a huge difference in terms of mediation. ASEAN is famously very cautious in its approach to crisis management um, and uh, doesn't like to interfere in the uh, internal affairs of its members. To date, ASEAN hasn't really been very effective. It did hold a special summit on the crisis. Um, you know, it did sort of uh, lay out some terms um, for peace that it wanted to see the junta follow, um, but the generals have ignored it. Um, and there's been quite a lot of talk in New York about the fact that with the ASEAN approach failing, the UN might have to jump back in and try and do some, some more on, um, on Myanmar, but no one has been quite, quite sure exactly what the UN could do. Uh, now, there is currently a slightly weird shift in the dynamic because ASEAN has its um, uh, leaders summit coming up. And the ASEAN leadership um, do not want to sort of have the, the military leadership of, of Myanmar at that summit unless um, they have made some concessions. And so it does look like the ASEAN is actually going to lean quite hard on Myanmar now uh, to try and make some concessions before the summit, or they may not even invite um, Myanmar to the summit. Um, so this, this could actually be the moment where ASEAN uh, gets a grip um, and does put some pressure on, on the Burmese generals. Um, but I would say that overall, sitting in New York, um, this has been a, a depressing story because it, it's felt like one of those moments where Security Council members, after an initial burst of enthusiasm, gradually back away from dealing with a crisis and leave it to someone else. Uh, you know, which again, I would contrast with the Ethiopia story where council members could easily just have dropped the entire game in the first quarter of this year, when it did look like the, that um, Ethiopia might win a decisive victory and, and move on. But instead, uh, the Africans, Ireland and others uh, kept the issue alive. And now the issue is, is very high on everyone's minds. Brilliant, Richard. Look, thanks very much for that, that answer. And we'll be discussing that more tomorrow, as I mentioned, with the UN Special Envoy. For Myanmar. Um, if we may, I just want to return to um, the climate resolution because you touched on that briefly in your in your presentation, just about where that currently sits. And you know, you said it could go either way, essentially, with with a couple of the key players who were, you know, there's there's there's, there's intensive discussions about trying to get them on side. And um, if we look ahead to sort of 2022 and the sort of switch that's going to happen with the the non permanent members, you know, what dynamics do you think will be at play then? You mentioned December as a possible cutoff. I mean, if we if we tip into January, what's the likelihood then with the sort of new members that are going to rotate in, of of reaching of reaching some sort of agreement there? So, I don't have a decisive breakdown of what the new members of the council will will do on uh, climate security issues. Um, but the the reason that there is I think a, a real urge now to try and get a resolution before the end of this year is that um, Ireland and Niger, I think with a lot of support from uh, Kenya, Norway, and you know, actually the backing of most council members, uh, worked very hard in the middle of this year to get a text that um, uh, all members of the council could agree to on climate security uh, with the exception of India, China, and Russia. And uh, the whole point was to sort of get unity within the uh, the bulk of the council, and then go to the you know sort of to show a unified front to um, uh, to the Chinese and Russians in particular uh, to try and persuade them not to veto this this resolution. Now, if you get to the first of January and the resolution has not um, not passed, then uh, it's going to be necessary to step back and start renegotiating with the new council members about what should, um, uh, what should be in this text. And, you know, just inevitably that will, that will take time. Uh, one of the incoming council members um, next year, Brazil, is known to be very, very skeptical, at least under its current leadership, about climate change diplomacy. 
and probably just wouldn't engage with this process. But even, you know, even the others, again, have to be sort of brought on board with the text that was agreed um, uh, under, under Irish stewardship this, this summer. So there is a bit of a deadline um, looming on the 31st of December. And um, I think everyone who supports this resolution would like to see it, uh, see it come through. Uh, I, you know, I just genuinely don't know if that will be possible. And I think that to some extent, the really big decisions are not going to be made in New York at all. Um, the really big decisions are going to be made in Beijing and Moscow. Um, in Beijing, China is going to have to decide does it want to be seen to be blocking a climate change resolution when China's overall global narrative is that um, it, uh, you know, that is actually a champion of multilateral cooperation on climate change, something that Xi Jinping was really emphasizing in his speech to the General Assembly. And it's possible that the Chinese will just look at this and think, you know, at the end of the day, it's not worth taking a reputational hit. We're, we'll abstain, we'll let this through. Uh, then you look at Moscow, and uh, the, the big question there is, does Vladimir Putin look at this, especially if the Chinese have indicated that they don't really, you know, uh, they don't really want to block this. Will Putin block it alone? Um, especially if he knows that it's something that the US really, really wants. Um, I'm not sure he necessarily will. So, uh, you know, you can get so far in New York, but a lot comes down to some of those um, conversations in, and some of those decisions in, in capital. Um, I, I think we're, we're now entering a period in terms of the diplomacy where uh, probably there's gonna be at least a month or so for bilateral discussions um, of this resolution. And you would hope that not only Irish diplomats and Norwegian diplomats in, in Moscow and Beijing, but also their US counterparts will be sort of giving some, some firm messages to the Chinese and Russians, just saying, look, you know, let this thing through. It's not actually a big threat to your interests. Um, and if they do that, it may, it, it may just work out. Okay, uh, Richard, really thanks, thanks for that for that bit of insight just on where that might go, because I think obviously Irish eyes are, are really watching that one keenly to see what, what materialises with it. Um, the question in here from Stephen Frayne, I think we touched on some of this already, but I'll put it to you specifically because it's it, it deals with sort of Ireland's, um, uh, you know, interest of its own on the foreign policy agenda and not necessarily cooperating with EU member states, but it specifically looks at Africa. Um, and he asks, can Ireland engage and coordinate more with other EU member states while maintaining its close relationships and working relationships with the African Security Council members? Or is there just too much divergence in the views of those other European states and the African states in particular? And um, so interesting to get your views on that one. Well, I think, I think I've already touched on this sort of, you know, the sense that Ireland has its own, its own identity in council politics, um, uh, which includes this sort of special link to the, the African group. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting if you then look at the other two EU members of the council, uh, you have France, um, which has its own uh, very deep, you know, links in, in Africa on the one hand, and then you have Estonia, um, which uh, has, I think, two diplomatic presences in, in all of Africa, um, an embassy in Cairo and then a, a, a liaison office in, in Addis Ababa. And, you know, just doesn't have the same sort of equities in, in African affairs that, that France does. So in, in, a, it, in a sense, it would be quite strange if um, these three countries uh, were all sort of on completely the same page in dealing, in dealing with the African group because they're, um, their interests are, are so divergent. That said, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, th I think that it is important that when it comes to dealing with a situation like Ethiopia going forward, as far as possible, you know, Ireland uh, speaks with the leverage of the whole EU group behind it. And so, uh, you know, just to give you an example of how this is problematic, you know, Ireland has, you know, through the year been pushing for sort of greater international attention to Tigray. We know that there are certain members of the EU 
um, I think Spain, for example, who have been quite wary of um, taking a strong line over Tigre. And within discussions in Brussels, have actually sort of argued for, for a more uh, a more moderate abro- approach to dealing with Addis Ababa. Now, clearly, um, Ireland would have maximum leverage in the Security Council um, over Ethiopian affairs if it genuinely spoke with the um, uh, the entire weight of the EU behind it. Um, it's possible that in some cases. You know, Irish diplomacy maybe has got a bit f- far away from where some EU members are, but I think it's also worth saying that some EU members have probably uh, made Ireland's life more difficult by not sort of you know fully supporting lines that Dublin would like. So it cuts it cuts both ways. Uh, thanks very much, Doug. And I know I know we did touch on that earlier on, but it's good to sort of actually delve into the specific African issue as well. There, so I appreciate you going back over that. Um, you mentioned when you glossed over Brexit um, in 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 your remarks. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that Brexit has reared its head, uh, which it often does in IA events, as a particular focus on Brexit. A question from Andrew Gilmore, and he says, uh, "Thanks for your presentation." And uh, some years ago, you wrote about the UK being an anchor for EU policy at the UN and the potential for Brexit to upset the key dynamics among the EU members in the UNSC. Um, can you comment on whether and to what extent these dynamics have changed in the post-Brexit era? Again, I think you have touched a little bit briefly on it, uh, but possibly interested to get a bit more, a uh, bit more, go a bit deeper on, on some of those issues around the specifics of the UK. Um, yeah, over to you, Richard. Um, so Brexit has definitely started to have an effect on UN diplomacy, although not always in the ways that um, you might have predicted in advance. I mean, I think the key thing to say is that um, happily, uh, UK relations with EU members um, in the UN seem to be quite insulated from uh, what's going on um, between Brussels and, and London, um, or indeed Brussels, uh, sorry, uh, London and, and Dublin at the moment. Um, cooperation on a sort of interpersonal desk to desk basis between UK diplomats in New York and their former EU counterparts remains pretty good. And what you hear from all the EU 27 is that actually when it comes to uh, you know, sharing information, sharing ideas, sort of strategizing about how to get stuff through the um, uh, through the UN. Uh, you know, the Brits the Brits remain very friendly and and generally very constructive. And so, I mean, that's you know that's a positive. We haven't seen um, the sort of breakdown in relations that uh, you know if you looked at some of the higher order stuff you might fear would would be taking place here. There are occasional moments of symbolic politics um, that create irritation. So back in February, the UK organized a big um, Security Council meeting on climate change um, with David Attenborough, which got everyone very excited. Uh, And they invited some non-council members such as Germany to speak at that, but they turned down uh, an EU request to speak. And it was clear that that was a sort of a, a small symbolic snub to the EU. But, you know, those sort of irritants do not outweigh the overall good spirit that exists in terms of, sort of cooperation. Um, I think that one of the reasons that cooperation is relatively friendly is actually to do with the circumstances under which Brexit took place, which was that in the first post-Brexit year, uh, last year, um, the Trump administration's position on things like Iran was um, so egregiously uh, destructive that the UK inevitably sided with the Europeans um, and didn't sort of drift off towards the US in the way that it might have done under other circumstances. So Trump actually, in a sense, made it easier for the UK to stay close to the EU um, because of America's behavior. Now, you know, things, things are changing, um, obviously, in the relationship with things like AUKUS. And I don't rule out that over time, we will see more of a UK 
EU divergence in um, in UN affairs. But for the time being, I'm optimistic that it will be a soft divergence and that actually um, on, on most of the issues on the council agenda, uh, London will find that it is, you know, it's 90% aligned with, with the EU and it, it won't be a huge problem. And I think that will be good both for the UK and for the EU. The one interesting footnote um, is actually post-Brexit, the country that's really having to reassess its role at the UN is France. Because, um, you know, France suddenly finds itself as the one permanent EU member of the council. And I think French officials are worried by talk that they should sort of Europeanize their position um, in New York to a greater degree. And what we've actually seen is the, is the French really emphasizing over the last year or so um, that they are not just a representative of the EU here, that they are a P5 member. And so, for example, Paris has been talking a lot with the Russians about the need for greater P5 cooperation. And I think one of the reasons for that is to show that they're not just going to translate uh, French influence at the UN into EU influence at the UN. Um, now, it's worth noting that Olaf Scholz, the man who is most likely to be the next German chancellor, uh, once said he thought that France should um, turn its council seat into an EU seat. And um, I wonder if that slightly worries people in the Elysee uh, as, as he sort of approaches the chancellorship. Um, but so, yeah, actually, in, in a weird way, Brexit has had a greater effect on French diplomacy here than in some ways on UK diplomacy, which is not not what I would have predicted um, two or three years ago. Fascinating, uh, Richard, really interesting um, turn that, that that answer took uh, towards the French. So uh, that's really interesting insight to get. Um, you, you briefly touched on it, and we'll finish on this one. Unless anybody wants to pop in, another question we can we can wrap up after this. I'll just put a final question to Richard. You mentioned AUKUS, and um, you know that also got you know French backs up, and they they were they were they were most displeased about sort of the, the coordination that was going on behind the scenes um, between the UK, the US, and Australia. Um, how how has that been perceived and received within the UN system around New York? Is there is there is there is there much to do about nothing, or are, are countries not happy that sort of this sort of mini lateral uh, streak has broken out? Um, and, and and how how has it been how has it been received? I mean, just uh, I'll throw one thing at you. We recently had uh, Noam Chomsky uh, speak to us at the institute about two weeks ago, and his his views on on the AUKUS um, collaboration was that you know essentially the US is, is is putting itself on collision course for some sort of inevitable conflict. Um, with China down the line, and if, if the US continues to pivot in this way by making those those deals, those type of deals, that's where we're heading. And um, so, yeah, so so a couple of different things there, but interesting to get your views on that, and then we'll wrap up, Richard. So, AUKUS, um, you know, AUKUS did uh, cast a shadow over the high level week of the General Assembly in um, in September purely for timing reasons, which was that the, the news broke, uh, I forget, maybe four or five days um, before Biden gave his big speech in, uh, in New York. And you know, this came on the back of the, the, Afghan, uh, the Afghan crisis. And I think it sort of, you know, it did feed into a sort of a general discourse around Biden's appearance that, you know, the US commitment to, to multilateralism was not all that Biden had cracked it up to be. But as I, th as I think I said in my initial remarks, I think Biden dealt with that, um, that sort of overall negative narrative quite effectively in his speech. I mean, he, he, he did talk about Afghanistan. He, he didn't talk about AUKUS, although he did have nice things to say, I think, about Australia as well as, um, as, well as the EU. But what I think what Biden got right actually in his speech, coming back to that, was that he, he recognized that for the vast majority of leaders who sit in the UN General Assembly Hall, you know, the question of submarines was just not relevant uh, to, to them or their publics. And what the majority of leaders from the developing world um, who were in New York, who otherwise don't have real access to the US president, what they wanted to hear was that 
the US was going to do more on vaccines for COVID and that the US was going to do more on financing for climate adaptation um, for poor states. And, um, you know, Biden really lent into those issues. I mean, you know, he, he talked a lot about the need to sort of, uh, you know, push out vaccines into countries where they haven't been received yet. He offered more money for climbing, uh, for climate financing. Um, I think I think he actually quite smartly caught uh, the the themes that sort of the UN audience wanted to hear, and AUKUS was slightly forgotten in that mix. Now, um, I didn't hear what what Chomsky had to um, to say to you, and uh, he's uh, you know he's got a long track record of um, not entirely pro-American foreign policy statements, but uh, you know obviously what he touched on is something that. Uh, does continue to shadow us at the UN, which is what is the future of UN-Chinese relations going to mean for a multilateral organization um, such as this one. And uh, on that, I would say that since, since the start of the year, despite differences over Ethiopia, despite differences over Myanmar, uh, the Chinese have done everything they can to avoid unnecessary clashes with the US. Um, I think there's been a degree of hedging um, by the Chinese because they have wanted to keep open the possibility of cooperation at the UN. And I think overall, probably Chinese-US relations at the UN have been better than Chinese-US relations in, in the wider world. Um, you know, the, the million dollar question looking into the future of the UN is, will the two powers continue to manage their relations at roughly this level of um, uh, amity, uh, because if they don't, um, then I think you're going to see a deepening crisis in multilateral cooperation. Um, and that won't just be in the Security Council, it will be much more generally. I mean, you've, you've seen in the last couple of weeks, people in the US demanding that the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, should should stand down because she allegedly uh, sort of fixed some IMF, no, sorry, some World Bank data to favor the Chinese. I mean, that sort of Chinese-US um, uh, competition, which we saw in pretty brutal terms in the Trump era, could do a lot to derail multilateral cooperation. And so, you know, looking well beyond Ireland's time in the Security Council, looking five years, 10 years ahead, um, you know, this, this is the sort of the, the biggest question that we face. Can, can Beijing and Washington continue to live together in New York? Richard, look, uh, thank you very much for, for all of your insights this evening. It's been, it's been a fascinating hour listening to you. We're just surely about o'clock and we'll wrap up there. I think everybody's tuning in and hopefully everybody that listens back to the discussion and watches it. Uh, we'll push it out on our, on our, on our social media channels um, and I think they'll, they'll enormously benefit from your insights. You're right at the heart of the action there and some of the, the insights you're able to share with us on a, on a whole range of issues. We touched on everything um, and, and I'm really delighted to, to have welcomed you and, and look forward to, to doing so again at some point in the future. Maybe even we get you over to Dublin uh, when it's safe to do so and we're back to some sort of level of normality. But Richard, thank you very much for joining us and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Have a, have a great evening.